It was here on the 25th of April, 1882, that Matthew Jackson Hunter, along with his wife, Alice Maud, and his young daughter, Elizabeth, made this walk. Within a few hours, two of those three people would be found dead in fields known as Park Hill. Now this is Grassington Road and this is the path and the, the roadway which the family would themselves have made back on the 25th of April 1882. Now obviously none of us know what was being said at that point. None of us will ever know what was going through Matthew's mind at that point. But we know one thing is factually correct and that is indeed all three of the family members made their way along this section of road here now obviously the road itself wouldn't have been like this it would have been cobbled one would presume but yeah for definite we know they came this way just to look at the views obviously that you guys have now got on what me and Vicky are looking at it's pretty hard to imagine that this pathway that we're on now, and I think it's called Short Lee Lane, but it's hard to imagine that it's barely changed in over 100 years, well over 100 years. The rolling landscapes to our right, and you can see, I think that is Castle Woods just in front. We'll know more when we get closer, but um, it's hard to imagine that this is roughly what perhaps this pathway would have looked like well over 100 years ago and in 1882. I mean, okay, there's a little bit of tarmac, but I think people get what I'm saying. It just looks proper old, like it's hardly been touched. But as for the views, the stunning views here in Skipton. Now, we're going to make our way, like I said, up this lane here, Short Lee Lane, I think it's called. Again, if I'm wrong, I'll put names and obviously titles down below. But this is the exact, again, the exact pathway that Matthew Hunter and his wife Alice and his young daughter Elizabeth would have trodden obviously unbeknownst to Alice and Elizabeth at the time what was going through Matthew's mind you know and what plans and that's if he had any plans to commit a double murder it is uh, like I said it's very hard to to understand and try to work out what he was thinking at that time but yeah I mean Matthew was walking up here Perhaps he was thinking of ending it all at this point. Perhaps he'd already thought about ending it all. Obviously days, weeks, months before this, sh this well, I say short trip over to Park Hill. Very hard to imagine and put yourself in his shoes and obviously his wife's and daughter's shoes. Now we're gonna get into the story more, like I said, as we get to Park Hill itself. But I do have to warn that it is quite graphic in some parts. Not for the squeamish. But this is why we are the Days of Horror channel. And this is why we cover these stories. They're not always funny. They're not always bizarre. Such as the Ilkley Moor alien photo we did the other week. We do cover the darker times of our lives. And that's what the channel is all about, ultimately. Now we're getting towards Park Hill now. And like I said, we'll talk more about the case once we get there. Walter Holgate, John Newby and George Phillips, three young boys. They had gone to Castlewoods for like an after dinner or an after lunch walk. And it would be these three boys that would encounter Matthew, who would be covered, drenched in blood. And they would also see the body of his wife, Alice. 
alongside him. And obviously, unbeknownst to them, they hadn't a clue what had transpired only minutes before their arrival. Now, whilst we will never know the exact spot of where Matthew, his wife Alice and daughter Elizabeth were found by the three young boys, we do know that they were seen, or I should say Matthew was seen, lying on his left hand side next to a hedge on a stile. Now, this itself here is the exit or entrance onto Park Hill. And this is Park Hill where we are now. We do have a feeling that it could well be somewhere around here where the murders took place. And we feel that the three young boys have left Castle Woods from that direction and made their way along this lane here. Like I said, it's very difficult for us to know the exact spots, but we do feel it could well be somewhere in this vicinity. When the three young boys had made their way onto the field and they noticed something just behind us, which we think is the place where the tragedy took place, obviously they were oblivious to what had gone on, as anybody would be. And it's only when they approached Matthew when they noticed obviously something more sinister had occurred. Matthew was, like I said, he was kind of lying on his left hand side. He was still alive. There was a large amount of blood. They noticed Matthew at this time was holding a knife in one of his hands. They also noticed a body lying on the floor to Matthew's left hand side, which would ultimately be obviously that of Alice, Matthew's wife. Now at this point, they never saw young Elizabeth lying under or just behind her mother, Alice. Now obviously they were shocked, they were confused by what they were seeing and they all scarped off back in this direction over Park Hill to go and fetch help. And it is, it's probably for us, it's going to be what, a 10, 15 minute walk? Mm -hmm. But they would have made their way into Skipton Centre itself and that is when they encountered or they approached a police officer. Matthew Hunter, at the time of the tragedy that took place in these fields, he was 27 years old at the time. Now his wife, Alice Maud, she was 25, and his young daughter, Elizabeth, she was only four years old. Now Matthew Hunter himself, like I said, he was 27, he was a young man, young family, but he had the responsibility of being an assistant overseer here in the town of Skipton. Now, the overseer, I had to look this up the other day because I wasn't too sure myself what it meant. But basically, he was kind of in charge of collecting rent money from businesses and, obviously, homeowners. Now, he'd been complaining about pains in his head in the days, weeks and months leading up to the murder here on Park Hill. But, obviously, we don't know what he said to people in regards to that as such. I mean, were they headaches, were they migraines? It's hard for any of us to, to even think about. But we do know that he had complained to a few people and even on the day of the murder itself, he would complain um, of suffering from severe pains in his head. And it was basically, it was bringing him down. I think it was a kind of depression he was probably suffering from. Now, Matthew from all accounts himself was a friendly, likeable young man never in trouble with anybody he was always diligent with his work he was always thoughtful when he was collecting rent money to people's needs because let's not forget 1800s victorian times times were hard money was hard to come by you know people were making the way in life best way they could so he realized at the time that obviously people were struggling to pay the rent money and, and the fair dues but um yeah, he was a well-known and well-liked character here in Skipton. It was just before 12 o'clock on the 25th of April when Matthew, along with his wife Alice and daughter Elizabeth, had left the home over on Primrose is it Avenue or Primrose Street, set further back in Skipton. They'd made their way along Grassington Road before they arrived here, like I said, at Park Hill. And like I said, further back, it's hard to imagine what... Um, what Matthew himself was thinking that morning. We do know, like I said, he tried to attack his family or he threatened to attack his family. 
months prior to the attack here on the 25th. And it all took place, or I should say he spoke about using his knife and attacking his family whilst visiting a public house, I think it was over in Emsey, which is further on in that direction. And the landlord at the time overheard him talking and acting in a strange behaviour that, that evening. When Matthew left that pub, the landlord himself followed him out and I think some kind of scuffle took place and it disarmed Matthew of the knife he was carrying or the knife he was brandishing in the, in the public house that evening. Now, like I said, Matthew was a well-known character here in Skipton and a lot of people knew him. Not everybody, but a lot. And it, by all accounts, from what I've read, the landowner, or the landlord I should say, he knew Matthew and he knew his family. So somehow that knife, one presumes, was handed over back to Alice herself. He obviously, the land, landowner obviously, spoke of what had occurred in his public house that evening. And I think, again, from what I've been reading, and it's very difficult because there's not a lot of information on this story, but reading between the lines, I think Alice was actually frightened for her, her well-being and her child's well-being. Because on the morning of the attack, when they were going up Grassington Road, a witness came forward saying that he'd spoke to Matthew shortly before 12 o'clock. And he spoke to Matthew about paying his rent. Now, this witness went to Primrose Hill or Primrose Avenue to pay his, his money, his rent money. And he was one of the witnesses that actually turned around and said that Matthew was complaining of pains in his head. And he was acting in strange behaviour. Now, young Elizabeth, who was outside with her mother, Alice, asked her dad if he should come into the house because they'd been waiting outside for quite a while. And Matthew, from all accounts, shouted back at her, no, you stay outside with your mother. But the witness said that Alice, the mother herself, was acting in a scared kind of manner, a scared behaviour. Now, obviously, we can only imagine that's because of what happened in the public house only a few weeks or a few months before. Perhaps things were said in the house leading up to the events that took place on the 25th. We'll never know. But the witness did come forward and say that Elizabeth was certainly acting in a frightened manner whilst waiting outside with her daughter, Elizabeth. Now, as I said further back, the views here in Skipton are absolutely stunning. And even though we pointed out Skipton Woods further down there, just look at the actual view here. And again, all, all of Skipton Woods just below us. And you can see the flag of Skipton Castle. I can't really see it on the GoPro, but I can see it with the naked eye from here. But absolutely stunning. Now, we've just got to this point, and I'm beginning to wonder, like I said, it's difficult to know where this attack took place. When I was doing the research for this story, I did come across these bricked up styles. Now, this looks like a more of a modern Built. It could have been rebuilt at some point. But from all accounts, like I said, Matthew was seen lying on his left-hand side. Not fully sat up, but kind of like slouching. And one article said there was a wall behind him. Other articles say it was a hedge. Could it have been here? And the boys have made their way up from, from the woods. Castle Woods in this direction. And along, and this is because apparently it was about eight feet, between eight and ten feet away from the hedge itself. And if you look, there is there is a kind of a hedge going round this perimeter here, and you've got the wall. So the family may have made their way across, which well we know that for a fact they made their way across the old lane there and up into Park Hill, which is all this. All this is Park Hill. Could you have got to this point where Vicky is now looking and it was here where the family were attacked and obviously murdered. It really is hard to, uh, to pinpoint, but this feels more like this could well have been the area where it took place. Now, 
obviously it could have also happened on this side we do have a gut feeling me and vicky now that it either occurred on this side of the wall or that side of the wall because again you've got your hedge going down down the field so ignore what we said about right at the beginning at the start of these fields it, it most certainly occurred we believe either on this side of this wall or on the opposite side of the wall um, you've got the hedgerows like i said both sides you have got a gate whether or not this would have been here back in 1882 i presume it would be and the boys have made their way up through castle woods because when you read the articles and it is on our website don't forget to visit www.daysofhorror.com for the full story when you read the article you will see that um, the boys themselves after seeing the three well the two because at the time we have to remember that young elizabeth wasn't seen by the three boys and, and matthew himself who began i must add he also began to slit his throat again in front of the three boys now the three boys at that stage panicked and run right down this hill down park hill they actually made the way down to the bottom and like i said it's there where i think it was police constable thistlethwaite or thistlewaite and a sergeant ben now they were alerted to obviously the events that occurred over here on park hill and they got here i think it was around two o'clock in the afternoon they that's when they actually got here now when the police arrived the two police officers arrived matthew was still alive he, he had severed his windpipe and done some serious wounds to himself but he was very much alive as for elizabeth and alice both were clearly dead now the injuries and this is where it does get graphic the injuries to alice were so bad that it was reported that her head was nearly severed from her body this is how ferocious the attack was also as for the way she was found her clothes were found in a ruffled manner like she'd been trying to fight off matthew she had stab marks on her hands she had cuts on her hands like she tried to defend herself or that of her child elizabeth as for elizabeth she was found with two incision marks one on the left one on the right side of her throat she was found lying towards the back of where alice was lying and like i said in the confusion and in a state of shock and panic the three boys never saw or they didn't see young elizabeth it's obvious to see that the wall itself has at some time been rebuilt you can just tell with the color of it and the way it is um, whether or not like i said these stone steps themselves were here back in 1882 again can't really answer that but um more certainly this is obviously it's clear it's a wall and we like i said we have read that it was a hedge and then another article says it was a wall between eight and ten feet away from the wall so like i said roughly in this this position but yeah i mean once again as i've said in quite a few videos recently we always like to put boots on the ground where these stories took place and bring you guys with us because it's all right talking about these stories but to actually be able to show people where these these atrocities and these these other stories took place we kind of feel like i said we kind of feel honored to to be able to do so because like you say it's not about just matthew in this case it's about his wife alice and his daughter elizabeth because like i said let's not forget their ages matthew was 27 his wife alice was 25 and his young daughter was only four years old when he took their lives and tried to take his own life when sergeant ben and pc thistleweight made the way here and obviously they'd inspected the surroundings the um, they also quickly started to bandage up with a scarf matthew's throat to stop further bleeding and they also asked matthew who committed this atrocity here on park hill and he he couldn't speak so he, he kind of nodded and i presume pointed to himself because he indicated that he had done this crime it's a bizarre one it really is a strange case i mean what what, what possesses a father and a husband to to commit the, these kind of crimes and in such barbaric cruelty as well 
again we can only imagine we can only try to presume and wonder why he, he did it if it was migraines was he suffering so badly from them which he couldn't no longer go on but why would you take the the life of your wife and your child you know i mean they've done nothing wrong that you know that, that we that we know of we've not read anything untoward um they were a young family they had the whole world in front of them they had all the lives in front of them so again i keep saying it but we, we, we can't even imagine i guess why why he did it what was the purpose behind it now his injuries were that severe it would take several days and weeks before anything further happened we know that matthew was taken to the work house which it's hard to point out but i think it's in this direction but he went to the Skipton workhouse where he spent, like I said, several weeks there um, recovering from his injuries, if you will. And he would, if finally, and he would, he would be charged with willful murder of his wife, Alice, and his child, Elizabeth. The charges themselves, like I said, they were, they were due to willful murder, but... A lot of people said he was insane. It was insanity that pushed him to it. And he even acknowledged whilst he was in the workhouse when he could slowly begin to speak, he acknowledged to several doctors that he had no recollection of what occurred here on the 25th of April. Again, he could have just been saying that. He knew he, what he'd done was obviously wrong, obviously. But he kept saying he had no recollection of what occurred here on the 25th. But ultimately, he would be charged with the brutal murders of his wife and child. And he would have his day in court in June 1882. Now, me and Vicky are now going to make our way to Walton Ray's Cemetery, which is only a few minutes away from where we are now. And that is where both Alice and her daughter, Elizabeth, were interred, and I think it was the 28th of April, 1882, around about 11 o'clock. They were both buried in the same grave, and rightly so. Um, they weren't separated. But we're going to make our way there now, and we'll talk more about Matthew and, obviously, the trial that took place in June, and what the outcome of that trial would be. So here at Walton Ray's Cemetery, we, we know Elizabeth is buried along with her mother here, somewhere, but where, we don't have a clue. They were buried together in the same grave on the 28th of April 1882, and the service took place at around 11 o'clock that morning, and apparently there were hundreds, if not a couple of thousand spectators here to pay their final respects, because the case had brought so much interest if you will into the town of skipton we've looked online but yet we can't find any reference deceased online ancestry we can't find any reference or when i say reference we can't find any headstone numbers so me and vicky are going to walk around all of the headstones that we can physically see because some of them as you can see a lot of spaces have uh I've lost the headstones on the markers. So we're going to try and find Alice and Elizabeth's final resting place. And if we do, obviously, we will put it in this video. Um, but it might be um, a forlorn attempt this, because like I said, there's, uh, there's a lot of space with no headstones. And we do find this quite a lot from stories in the mid to late 1800s, unfortunately. Well, sure, like I said, we might as well take in a couple of headstones themselves. Look at the carving on this one, guys. How beautiful is that? And this is for... Is it Abel Richardson Pearcy of Skipton? 
but uh, I like the shield and rest in peace like the angel holding the shield pretty cool and another one with some unique ornate carvings two children I'm not quite sure what they're holding in the hands obviously one's a book but I'm not sure what what this is but again some unique um, headstones here at Walton Race Cemetery in Skipton Jonas Henry son of Thomas and Mary Ann Laycock died September 24th 1876 aged one years and ten months also Clara died March 12th 1882 aged two years and four months god this is a children's grave also Wilfred died May 16th 1883 aged four years and ten months also is it is it Sir Wilfred son of the above who died June 5th 1886 aged one years and six months also of Nelson Laycock died May 3rd 1889 aged 14 months oh, that's loads of children also of Rennie Laycock dies or died October the 1st 1891 uh, aged 25 years George Laycock aged three years Beatrice Maria Laycock six years and Annie Laycock aged 30 years wow so how many children is that so I can understand why there's two children carved into this headstone but that's sad so many young lives in one burial plot now whilst we're here at Walter and Ray Cemetery we thought we'd come and pay our respects to one of Victoria's relatives and this is T.W. Storey Royal Engineers 4th of January 1917 aged 35 201412 Sapper so we've got a war hero here part of the family and we do have other relatives we've got Wilfred Bishop 1902 to 1965 and Evelyn Bishop 1904 to 1993 and then we do have Carter Dunn 1997 now as you can see it's uh, it's quite a large cemetery is this you've got old headstones mixed with new headstones and it goes in that direction and further back over there where Vicky's now investigating we've just done a sweep of these two locations as well as some just behind here um, and we've had no no sign of Alice and Elizabeth's headstone we're all looking for the surname Hunter um, it's not a common surname I wouldn't have thought but at the moment nothing seems to be showing itself to us so we're going to carry on with this side of the cemetery and uh, hope for the best when Matthew arrived at the Leeds Assizes in June of 1882 to stand trial for the murder of his wife Alice and his daughter Elizabeth he was undefended basically was defending himself he never paid or nobody was hired to defend him he had to be led up to the dock by two police constables because he was also in a weak state his injuries that he caused himself were still quite severe now even though he lived through his attempt at suicide obviously he was still in a weak state of mind as well as physically so he had to be led up to the dock itself by two police officers and he kept having to sit down, try to stand up, sit back down they offered him bottles of water which he refused whilst he was in the dock he wouldn't speak he basically took everything that the prosecution threw at him and the prosecution spoke to around about half a dozen witnesses the three young boys who had obviously encountered the horrific scenes of Park Hill 
they spoke to Emily, the sister of Alice. Now, Emily herself resided with Matthew, Alice and their daughter, Elizabeth, for three months prior to the attack. And she would also state that he wasn't a violent man, but he did occasionally throw out the odd threat of destruction, in her words. He was going to cause somebody harm, not necessarily his family, but somebody some harm. So quite rightly, they were frightened. And this kind of explains why Alice herself looked quite upset and emotional and frightened on the morning before she was murdered up on Park Hill. Other witnesses came forward, such as the police officers who would describe in detail what they encountered up on Park Hill, such as the horrific injuries sustained to both Alice and Elizabeth. But it was a pretty much open and shut case. Now, at the end of all the, the testimonies and all the evidence had been placed, the jury just had one decision to make, and that was, was he guilty of murder? Now, the strange and bizarre thing about this is, even though quite obviously he had murdered his wife and young daughter, Elizabeth, in such a brutal way, the prosecution and the jury didn't find him guilty of murder. If that makes sense, which it doesn't. <laughs> Basically, he would, he would be deemed insane. The verdict would be, it would be murder, but classed as insanity. It was insane at the time of the murders. So rather than do time in prison for murder, or possibly be found guilty of murder, and then obviously given the death sentence of hanging, instead, the jury recommended that he serve time at her, at her Majesty's pleasure at Broadmoor. Now, Broadmoor was a high security lunatic asylum back in the 1800s. I could be wrong, but I still think Broadmoor is still there as a psychiatric unit and it's still high secure. But most certainly, Matthew would spend quite a long time at Broadmoor, or Broadmoor, I should say. Now, I'm not sure how long exactly he spent there, if he died there, if he was ever released. There's no further records on what happened to Matthew once he was sent to Broadmoor itself. We're now going to make our way back to the car. Unfortunately, we've not had any luck finding the final resting place of Alice and her daughter, Elizabeth. Yeah, I'm really, really gutted about that because, again, two lives, two young lives, cruelly taken from them for no fault of their own. They didn't ask for what happened back on the 25th of April, 1882. They just went for a walk with their husband and their father to Park Hill, which is way over in that direction. The young daughter especially, Elizabeth, she didn't have a clue what was, what was going on. And I doubt Alice had any clues as to what was going on in her husband's mind. But it's such a sad and cruel story. And one that, despite the context and the nature of this story, we do hope you guys have enjoyed it nevertheless and find it interesting. So like I said, I'm gonna make my way back to the car now. And I think what I might do is spend a little more time at some point, like I do with other stories that we've covered already. And I will try and find a little bit more information on this because somewhere out there, there will be records on where both Alice and Elizabeth are buried and hopefully we will, uh, we will come back one day and either rekindle this tragic story or just come and pay our respects and maybe do a short video at their final resting place. Now, what I will do, I'll ask you guys, I'll put it out there. From all the story and the evidence and what we've spoke about in this video, do you think Matthew had planned that morning or the days leading up to that morning to murder his wife, Alice, and his young child, Elizabeth. Do you think it was pre-planned? He took with him a shoemaker's knife, a small shoemaker's knife. It was, it was a tiny, a tiny, tiny blade, but yet it caused so much destruction and violence upon 
perhaps more so his wife than he did with his daughter Elizabeth but nevertheless he still killed two of the people he was supposed to look after with all his all his might if you will he was supposed to cherish them love them honor obey all that stuff but yeah he took their lives in, and I keep saying the word but it's such a brutal and barbaric fashion was it pre-planned or was it something he did on the spur of the moment now obviously none of us know what was going on behind the scenes I know Emily his sister-in-law if you will she mentioned at the inquest that he had threatened some people or somebody with some form of violence either with a knife perhaps or with his fist nobody knows so something was bullying under the surface we don't know if something had gone wrong within the marriage we don't know if Alice herself had had enough of his maybe his outburst that he was showing in the house we don't know um, but it would be interesting to know your thoughts on this if you think Matthew himself had pre-planned the attacks on his wife and on his daughter such a tragic and I'll keep saying it but such a bizarre tale So that is all from here at Walter Ray Cemetery and in the heart of Skipton. If you did enjoy this story, don't forget guys to give us a big thumbs up. Don't forget to comment down below on this tragic tale. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we're constantly bringing you new videos pretty much every week. It's a tragic story. I'm so sorry that we couldn't find the final resting place of Alice and Elizabeth. I would really love to pay my respects at their, their burial place. But alas, we've been beaten again because of the many years that have since gone by. But like I said, if you did enjoy this story, guys, don't forget to do all those things I mentioned. Big thumbs up, comment and subscribe, and don't forget to share the video. But in the meantime, here from Walter and Ray's Cemetery in Skipton, take care, look after yourselves, and me and Vicky will be back soon with another tale from our dark, but at times, glorious past. Take care, guys.